Hotel in the Corner, Bitter and Sweet, page 69. They can't take them all away. What would happen to the strawberry farms on Bashan Island and the sawmill on Bainbridge? What about the fishermen, she said. Henry listened to their conversation in Cantonese as if it were coming from a distant radio station. Huh? Plenty of Chinese workers. Plenty of colored workers. They switch short on labor, even Boeing hiring Chinese now. Todd Shipyards is hiring and paying the same wage as Caucasian, his father said, smiling. Henry grabbed his book bag and headed for the door, wondering what might happen to Keiko if her father was arrested. He didn't even know what her father did to earn a living, but it really didn't matter now. Henry, you're forgetting your lunch, his mother said. He told her he wasn't hungry, in English. She looked at Henry's father, puzzled. She didn't understand. Neither of them did. Henry walked past the corner on South Jackson. It was quiet and empty without Sheldon there to send him off. Henry was happy that his friend had found a job up the street, but having Sheldon around was like an insurance policy. No bully who followed Henry made it home past Sheldon's corner and his protective eye. In class that day, Mrs. Walker told everyone that their classmate, Will Whitworth, would be gone for the rest of the week. His father had been killed while serving on board the USS Marblehead. Japanese dive bombers struck his convoy near Borneo in the Macassar Strait. Henry didn't know where that was, but it sounded like someplace warm, tropical, and far away. He wished he was there as he felt the eyes of his classmates drill into him, tiny, piercing darts of accusation. Henry had had only one run-in with Will, and it was earlier in the year. Will seemed to fancy himself a war hero, doing his part to fight the yellow menace on the home front, even if it was only on the playground after school. Despite the black eye Will had given him, Henry genuinely felt sorry for him when he heard his news. How could he not? Fathers weren't perfect, but even a bad one seemed better than no father at all, at least in Henry's case. When lunchtime mercifully approached, Henry was excused. He ran, then walked, then ran again down the hall and into the cafeteria kitchen. Keiko wasn't there. Instead, Denny Brown, one of Chaz's friends, stood there wearing a white apron, ladle in hand. He sneered at Henry like a rat caught in a trap. What are you looking at? Mrs. Beatty stomped around the kitchen, patting herself, trying to find where she left her matches. Henry, this is Denny. He'll be subbing for Keiko. He got caught stealing from the school store, so Vice Principal Silverwood wants me to put him to work. Henry watched, mortified. Keiko was gone. His kitchen haven was now occupied by one of his tormentors. Mrs. Beatty called off her search for a pack of matches and lit her cigarette on the stove's pilot light, then grumbled something about staying out of trouble as she wandered off to eat her lunch. At first, Henry had to listen to Denny grumble about being caught, getting kicked off flag duty and cornered into working in the kitchen, forced to do the work of a Japanese girl. But when the lunch bell rang and hungry kids rolled in, Denny's attitude changed as they smiled and chatted him up. They all wanted him to serve them, holding back their trays, leering suspiciously at Henry as they passed. To them, Henry thought, we're at war, and I'm the enemy. He didn't wait for Mrs. B to get back. He set his scoop down, removed his apron, and walked away. He didn't even return to his classroom. He left his books and his homework, passing down the hall and out the front door. In the distance, in the direction of Neonmachi, he noticed small plumes of smoke disappearing in the gray afternoon sky. So at this point, if there's a lot of time left, would you please continue reading Fires, 1942, page 72 through 74? Otherwise, we'll pick up here next time we're in class. Thanks, guys.